Hello? Ah, okay. This works. All right. I think it's um, half past now. So let's gonna start. Um, so welcome everyone. Uh, today we're gonna talk about uh, running um, Kubernetes on OpenStack and a bit more, uh, also on bare metal, and how to do it in a way that's that's fast. Uh, that, that's why we do it on bare metal too, uh, among other things. Um, but let's start by talking about the the vision, the concept of the open hybrid cloud, because I it's all related, as as you're gonna see. So when you are a developer, and I'm sure many of you are developers here, um, you shouldn't care too much about the underlying platform that you are using. But uh, in general, you're gonna have four types of footprints, right? You're gonna have a physical uh, platform where uh, whichever um, uh, other platform to uh, do development um, is installed, or a virtual one, and it can be a private cloud or a public cloud. So these are, these are essentially the four um, footprints, and in particular, we can divide them between the uh, public clouds, uh, there are a number of them uh, listed in here, there are many more out there, or on-premise, in, in private clouds, okay? So today we're gonna talk about the private cloud, and um, in particular, Kubernetes on OpenStack, and then Kubernetes on bare metal, right? Um, in this case, Kubernetes using CoreOS, right, as the operating system to run everything else on top of OpenStack. Okay, so let's start then. Um, why, first off, starting with Kubernetes on OpenStack, uh, why Kubernetes on OpenStack? Well, um, the two platforms are really well integrated, right? Uh, we've been working on the integration uh, for a number of years now uh, with many different uh, components. Um, at the same time, as I said before, Kubernetes itself is workload driven. That means that uh, I only care about the workloads when I'm a developer. And as I said, I don't really care as a developer too much about everything else, right? So I want it to work and that's it. Um, but for those of us working on the integration, um, there are things very important about uh, how to integrate Kubernetes and OpenStack. Uh, for example, OpenStack is as it says in here, programmatically driven, uh, API driven, right? So we can uh, use the APIs that o OpenStack exposes to work on this integration. And we've done this with a number of uh, projects in OpenStack, as you will see. Uh, at the same time, OpenStack itself, in general, is a platform that scales very well. Uh, it's been designed since the beginning uh, with the concept of scaling, uh, scaling in the data center. Uh, and it scales across all the infrastructure, right? OpenStack um, is an abstraction layer for compute, for networking, uh, even for storage, right? And it goes across all the data center. And it's on top of a very solid foundation, which is Linux, right? Here, um, by the way, uh, my name is, sorry, I didn't introduce myself before. Uh, <laughs> My name is Ramon Acedo Rodriguez, and uh, I'm a product manager from uh, working for Red Cat. That's why you're gonna see the Red Cat logo all over here. And uh, among other things, I'm the pro product manager responsible for OpenShift on OpenStack, and also for uh, something that you're gonna see in a minute, uh, which is bare metal provisioning uh, with Kubernetes, uh, among other things. And also the project Ironic, we're gonna talk about Ironic uh, here. So uh, at Red Cat, I work for the Ironic team as uh, the product manager. Okay, sorry about that. Ba back to the slides. Uh, okay, let's start with the uh, integrations, Kubernetes on OpenStack integrations. And the idea is that um, these two platforms are complementary. They don't compete with each other. They, they, they use each other, especially Kubernetes uses um, OpenStack, right? So OpenStack exposes the resources by API uh, and OpenShift as a platform consumes these resources, right? So that, that difference needs to be clear, for especially for those of us who are uh, developing the integration, but also for anybody, any administrator that is running OpenShift or Kubernetes on OpenStack. Um, you're gonna see during this presentation that I use the um, OpenShift word. Uh, OpenShift is a deployment of uh, Kubernetes, it's a Kubernetes cluster, 
it involves more things, but essentially uh, they are exchangeable in, in the context of uh, today's presentation, right? I'm only talking about uh, a Kubernetes cluster, right? Uh, okay, so uh, then integration points. The essential integration points between these two platforms are compute, storage, and network, okay? Um, now that in as compute, I mentioned, if you're familiar with OpenStack, Nova and Ironic, right? So virtual machines, bare metal. Uh, for storage, there are at least two integration points, uh, one through um, the block devices, through Cinda, and another one for object uh, through, uh, well, you can call it Swift, uh, Serverless Gateway. Um, and then on the network, we're gonna expand on the network a little bit today. Uh, you can use Octavia and uh, Courier. We're gonna talk about Courier today. Um, let's see an example. Uh, wh what do I mean with this integration that uh, we are working on? Well, um, if you are using uh, Kubernetes and you need a persistent volume and then you create a persistent volume claim, you don't really care uh, if it's OpenStack underneath, if it's AWS or, or what is it. What you care about is the persistent volume, right? And what happens under the hood is since the two platforms are integrated, deeply integrated, as I was saying before, um, OpenShift knows that it needs to tell OpenStack, hey, can you create a, a volume for me? And when you have it, tell me what it is uh, so that I can present it to the uh, pod that requested it. And that's it. That's essentially it. And to make this transparent for the developers. Okay, so this would be how it works. Uh, in this case, you have OpenShift uh, as a platform above here, OpenStack platform. You have a virtual machine, and uh, if you're familiar with um, how Cinda works, so through the Cinda API, this volume is gonna be created, it's going to be attached, and it will end up in the uh, pod where the app is, is running, okay? So this is an example. Let's see this a little bit bigger, uh, how a typical logical architecture uh, would look like of OpenShift and OpenStack. So in here you have OpenShift on top, OpenStack here, and there are a few important things here. Uh, one of them is you have your applications, which is the only thing you care about, really, and these applications can be running on virtual machines directly or on containers, right? And these containers can run at the same time on virtual machines or on bare metal nodes, yeah? And also, you have a number of other services. Here you can see Cinda, Swift, Octavia, Courier, that are part of this uh, architecture that, in a sense, they are used, uh, again, transparently for you. When you install this, this is what's happening, right? Uh, they, uh, as I said, are complementary. One exposes the services and the other one consumes it. Uh, so, yeah, this is how it looks in terms of, uh, how it looks in terms of uh, logical architecture. Let's now see um, a little bit more technical. Today it's not gonna be super technical, but just a little bit. And if you want to do this, uh, well, you will need an installer. Uh, before you proceed with the installation, you wanna, uh, are gonna want to know what do I need in here to deploy uh, OpenShift or Kubernetes on OpenStack? So when we've done this, this is uh, what we ended up with uh, in terms of recommending how uh, or what do I need from OpenStack. I put a QR code in there so that uh, you can uh, go to the link directly. But this is what you need. Uh, we, um, in this latest, uh, say, inception, with uh, what we call the OpenShift installer that installs uh, a, a Kubernetes cluster um, on OpenStack, on other platforms as well, but on OpenStack. And we did it with um, what we call OSP 13, which is OpenStack Queens. Uh, we tested all of these. We realized that, uh, well, we needed three master nodes, two worker nodes, with at least, it's not like we recommend these uh, sizes, but at least uh, these sizes, these uh, flavors that you're gonna use on OpenStack. You need object storage. Uh, this is something uh, that you need right now so that uh, all of this is based or, or it's using CoreOS. CoreOS uses an inception, uh, an inception. Uh, uh, how is it called? The, the cloud init of uh, CoreOS, Ignition. An Ignition file 
and that ignition file uh, will temporarily be uh, stored in Swift, okay? So that's why you need Swift uh, so far. And a core OS image. And then uh, in terms of OpenStack resources, well, I'm not gonna list them, but um, when we finished, we saw that uh, this is on a you know plain cluster right after the installation what's uh, used. So that is so that you are ready when you go and do this. Um, one more thing, uh, something, and this is again, as part of the installer, the OpenShift installer, which is what's uh, doing all of this. You're gonna see a bit more about the installer right now. Um, you know that Kubernetes, uh, OpenShift, requires uh, a DNS internally for, for example, so that each master knows about each other master, right? Each worker knows about all the other workers. And uh, this is internal DNS, right? So with the installer, uh, we install a uh, core DNS and MDNS that's running on the nodes, right? You don't have to worry about that. This just happens. If you're interested in uh, how it works, you can look at the containers. But uh, as as an administrator, you know that this happens and that you don't need to worry about that. You don't need to mess with, I don't know, slash ETC hosts or anything like that. Um, in terms of load balancing, similarly, uh, there's another container that will do the load balancing internally for you so that you have, uh, and, and it's using, by the way, uh, HA proxy and keep alive the, so that you can have the VIPs uh, for the internal API, the ingress traffic to the workloads, right, and the internal DNS requests. So I think this is good for you uh, to, to know there's a link to understand how this works. Then again, as an administrator, you don't care, and that's a good thing, uh, because if this didn't exist, you would have to come up with a way uh, for the cluster to do this. Okay, so now on the networking. Courier, what is Courier? How many of you are familiar with Courier or have heard about it, yeah? Some of you, but not everyone. Okay, so Courier is, let's say, part of the network integration, and as it says in here, it improves the performance. Um, let's think about why this exists. Um, if you think about how uh, a pod talks to another pod, um, if you use what uh, we call the OpenShift SDN, uh, you will see that uh, it creates a VXLAN tunnel and all the traffic goes through this VXLAN tunnel. Now, if you're familiar with OpenStack, you know that OpenStack does exactly the same. To communicate a virtual machine with another virtual machine, a VXLAN tunnel is created, and if a virtual machine has, uh, say, a master node, or, or rather, a, a node, a worker node, and another machine on top of OpenStack, another worker node with pods that need to talk to each other, what happens? that you have a VXLAN tunnel inside another VXLAN tunnel. That's double encapsulation. That doesn't sound great, right? It happens all the time anyway. But hey, we came up with a way of fixing this so that you don't have in the two headers, you know, too much space used and too much uh, packet fragmentation, right? Essentially, if you're familiar with all of this, uh, you know what I'm talking about. But essentially what you know, and I'm gonna show you some numbers, is that this makes the communication much faster when running OpenShift, when running Kubernetes on OpenStack. Um, it's, it's a CNI, it's a container network interface uh, on, on, on Kubernetes. And as it says in here, it provides the communication right, between uh, pods when running on OpenStack. Um, now, this is recommended most of the time, but not all the time. Um, it's recommended when uh, you have tenant networks, right, uh, and as I said, when you have tenant networks, the VMs in them communicate each other through uh, VXLAN tunnels, and this is the problem that you want to solve the double encapsulation, VXLAN on VXLAN, right? Uh, so when you have this, it's recommended. But when you don't have that, when you don't have um, the, the, the tenant networks and you're using uh, VLAN-based provider networks where the OpenStack virtual machine is connected directly to the network, the physical network, right, that you have with other parts of, of your network, not just OpenStack, then it's not needed. It's not like it's not recommended, it's, it's, it's not, it doesn't solve. Uh, the problem that it's been designed for. 
I don't think that it does. Uh, it's integrating with Octavia. Uh, how many of you, of you know what Octavia is? Okay, so Octavia, uh, not everyone, is the load balancer that uh, as a service that provides uh, OpenStack. And Octavia, for every load balancer that you need, will create a virtual machine. And the virtual machine, as small as it may be, is a still uh, a workload running on your hypervisor. So say that you expect a lot of uh, services exposed with Kubernetes, you know, when you scale uh, an app and uh, then you need a load balancer that distributes the traffic among all the, um, you know, little uh, pods that you have in there, among the nodes. So it will create a VM. So if you happen to have not many hypervisors, perhaps uh, the performance uh, improvement in the network that you get through Courier uh, can be great, but at the cost of uh, an overhead in the hypervisor because of the virtual machines that it's running, okay? So if, if, if you're still with me, uh, you know that uh, Courier will be using Octavia as a load balancer. Internally, it uses uh, trunk ports as well. And well, um, we tested it and we made it uh, fully supported with Queens, uh, with um, OSP 13. Okay, uh, a little bit more about the Courier internal architecture. Uh, so here you can see, so this would be uh, an OpenStack compute node. And in this OpenStack compute node, you have uh, a virtual machine. This virtual machine is, is an OpenShift or uh, a Kubernetes uh, node. And I'm sure if you've ever been debugging a little bit uh, virtual machines on OpenStack, you've seen the uh, BRInt, OBS, right? Uh, which inside the virtual machine, it's just uh, it's zero or it's, uh, whatever. Um, okay, so this is pretty much how it works. Uh, the CNI of Courier uh, is connected to the pods and to the outside is connected to Neutron. And this is where the magic happens, right? So this, this in here is what will do the more or less translation saying, hey, you don't need, uh, you have a VXLAN channel there, uh, so I'm gonna use this VXLAN endpoint to connect uh, this pod that wants to go to another VM. So that's essentially the idea, right? And, and as I said, it's integrated with both Octavia and Neutron. Okay? Are you still with me? Yeah? Okay. So we did recently, uh, I think just before the summer, uh, some performance tests to see the gain because, yeah, we, we know that it's faster. Uh, but many times I was getting the question of uh, how much faster? Right? Should I care? Uh, well, this is one of the tests that we did um, between pods on the same hypervisor, okay? Not two separate hypervisors. Initially, we wanted to see if, if per se, is, is there any performance improvement? There's a little bit. We did it with three types of packet size, uh, 64, 1024, uh, and 16,384. And yeah, yeah, there's a little bit of uh, performance, but perhaps not enough to justify, uh, well, having a team, developing career, a community, etc. But yeah, yeah, there's uh, an, an, uh, an interesting improvement. But where we noticed the most um, improvements uh, is when you have to have, uh, when you have to run um, data across two different hypervisors. This, is, this was really impressive. Uh, we knew it was faster, but when we saw the numbers, uh, it was like nine times faster. Well, it seems, yeah, uh, not having fragmentation, using the same channel, um, is, is, is really a very decent uh, improvement, okay? Uh, we did many more tests, not just this. And we published uh, a blog with, you know, what we found, uh, some reflection on it. And well, here you have the link for you to read it. It's very interesting. Okay, now uh, more reading. I'm gonna give you more reading if you're still interested in the subject, and that's a reference architecture. So we said, look, we people are doing this. Uh, why don't we do it as well and then make some recommendations of how do we see um, good practices, uh, a reference architecture that you can use as the basis for your own architecture. And we did it 
with um, well um, OSP 13 that's that's uh, OpenStack Queens and OpenShift 3.11 that's uh, Kubernetes uh, 1.11 if I recall correctly right and we're working on a new one by the way but it'll be a, a similar idea what, what you're gonna get here you're gonna find a lot of advice on um, how to do it how the services uh, work with each other in detail so that, that's a very interesting document if you want to do um, this combination now let's let's try to install this okay uh, ways to install it and first uh, I wanted to talk about the OpenShift installer. The OpenShift installer will install OpenShift. Uh, that's what its name uh, says. Uh, it will create a, a, a Kubernetes cluster for you. And there are essentially two ways of doing this depending on the level of customization that you want or need. One is, well, I want my installer to do everything for me. All I want is to point the installer to the infrastructure, in our case to OpenStack, and let the installer decide everything, create the virtual machines, uh, create all the services, the security groups, install everything, and when it finishes, it will tell me how to access. Great. So that's what we call the uh, IPI, Installer Provisioned Infrastructure. There's another way uh, of installing this uh, with the installer, which is, well, no, I'm, I'm going to create all the resources myself. I'm going to create the virtual machines here and there, uh, of this size and that size, right? So that, instead of being provisioned by the uh, installer, it's provisioned by the user, okay? So we start with this. And, well, this is essentially what happens with the first one, the installer provisioned. Uh, you have an OpenStack cluster installed, and this, the installer, will create the OpenShift cluster for you. And that means that before installing the OpenShift cluster, it needs to tell OpenStack, hey, Create the networks, um, the internal load balancers and DNS I already explained. Uh, this is not an open stack. These are containers, which makes our lives a little bit easier. But create for me the instances, deploy core OS, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? So this is what happens. And at the same time, uh, very obvious, all of this uh, will have to be done by a user previously to proceed with the installation in the other um, installation experience. Okay, so far so good. If you want to do it on OpenStack, uh, we we have documented this here on, on GitHub. Um, initially, the in the first iteration, when we developed this, uh, we've done the IPI type of installation. Uh, we are working uh, a lot actually right now on the UPI type of installation that you have in here. Take a look, try it out, and well, let us know uh, what your experience is. Uh, you can open uh, issues in GitHub uh, for um, the installer, and uh, we, we are more than happy to hear your feedback and, and help you with the, with the process. Um, if you use uh, Red Hat and you go to try.openshift.com with your uh, Red Hat account, you will notice that there are a number of platforms, and there's this platform here. It will do essentially the same as, uh, right now it's the IPI, the same as uh, we described in the IPI installer, right? Everything downstream, fully supported. Now, done with this, more or less, second part of this uh, talk, um, in this case, more about bare metal. And it's still Kubernetes, OpenShift on bare metal, but I wanted to spend some time talking about bare metal. Um, in the past, I would say, three years or so, since 2017, maybe 2016, a little bit, we've seen a uh, huge interest, in general, on uh, bare metal. Uh, that's pretty cool. Uh, that's pretty cool. We've seen how Amazon is provisioning uh, bare metal nodes for you if you want, some of the clouds as well. We've seen how in the OpenStack service, the numbers of um, OpenStack deployments with Ironic, which is the bare metal uh, service in OpenStack, has increased by a lot. And um, I haven't seen the report for 2019, but uh, I would expect that it's, it's still uh, growing. And the reason, well, there are many reasons, right? But uh, some of the reasons that uh, we have identified uh, are, in particular, Kubernetes on bare metal, that's one, and that's an important one. Uh, 
this is not new, but um, HPC, high performance computing, that's, that's very common since the beginning where you say, well, a virtual machine is, is not enough for me, or when you need to have direct access to uh, dedicated hardware devices, right? Yes, we do a lot of PCI pass-through, et cetera, but sometimes in the scientific, communi scientific community, they need uh, to do this. Or, it, for example, I know of uh, a customer that's uh, using Ironic to test different uh, CPUs. Like you create a CPU, you make some changes in the CPU, and you want to compare um, the results uh, of uh, you know a test with the previous CPU and the new CPU. And they use Ironic to do this. That, that's another pretty cool use case. All right. Um, and then let me talk about the OpenStack bare metal service, Ironic. That's the logo there. Um, which was actually designed by um, a colleague at, at Red Cat as well, some time ago. And a number of features in here. Uh, I'm going to cover some of them uh, real quick uh, because we don't have a lot of time. But uh, it's just for you to see the power of uh, running bare metal in the private cloud as if it was a virtual machine. So essentially, hardware lifecycle management, great reason, right? Uh, you have your uh, hardware inspected in there with all the uh, details for you to access uh, whenever you need, uh, for you to deploy and deploy with any operating system that uh, works on, on your bare metal nodes that's stored on your open stack, essentially as if it was uh, virtual machines. And that's amazing to be able to do this with uh, bare metal. That's, that's really an achievement. Um, what else? Uh, we do cool things like what I was saying, inspecting. The inspection that even extracts information from the network using LLDP. Um, what else? Well, yeah, it, it uses the same type of images as you would use with virtual machines and QCOW2. Uh, it does things like uh, rooted deployments. Uh, we're going to see a little bit of that. Multi-tenancy, like with proper isolation between networks, uh, auto-discovery. A number of power management uh, devices are supported. Let's see um, a very cool one. This is multi-tenant. And I wanted to spend some time talking about this because um, this is not an easy one. Essentially, what we do here is uh, when you have multiple tenants accessing the same nodes, right? but still they are separate tenants, so you want to keep them separate from one another, well, you need a way to isolate the bare metal nodes at the network level. So how do we do that? Well, we need to go to the switch, and then we need to change the VLANs, where you associate one tenant to one VLAN, one or more VLANs, right? And dynamically, a provision in time, because a, a node will be now uh, owned by tenant A, and maybe later, when tenant A leaves that node, tenant B comes in and uses uh, that node again, right? And you want to make sure that tenant B cannot access to the network of tenant A. Right, do that with VLANs. It's a very simple um, concept. We've been using this for many, many years. But now you need a way to do that in an automated way in, in a private cloud in this case, right? So essentially, this is what we do. And if you know about OpenStack and Neutron, well, we do it with an ML2 driver that uh, it's based on Ansible, on Ansible networking. And uh, you don't need to worry too much about that, just to install it. Uh, and, and you know that it's, it's using Ansible. And what it does is you boot the bare metal node as if it was a virtual machine. You say open stack, server start, da da da, OK. And then the ML2 plugin configures the switch. It goes to the switch and it says, hey, uh, configure a provisioning network in there. So configure this VLAN. And during the installation of the node, you use a separate VLAN that nobody can access, only the administrator. Well, you decide that, right? But uh, that's the idea, that nobody can access that. Once the bare metal node is provisioned, this plugin goes back to the switch port and configures the switch port to the VLAN of that tenant, OK? So this is a pretty cool uh, feature. And the same way you terminate the node, right? It's, it's clean. This is a very cool ten um, feature. And uh, it essentially makes bare metal the bare metal experience on par with that of uh, virtual machines. Another one, and um, and I also wanted to dedicate some time to this one because th this is um, very used, by the way. If you have seen uh, this network topology, uh, how many times have you heard, or how many of you have you heard the 
leaf and spine network topology. Yeah, some of you have been working on uh, networking teams, right, or with them. So th it's very popular. It's very popular among uh, network uh, teams. And in here, what you do is, well, you have your ironic nodes that are capable of provisioning all these nodes. Only that, uh, if this is leaf zero, this is leaf one, and this is leaf two, each leaf is a separate network. It's a separate subnet. It's a different subnet. And you know how ironic works, right? Ironic will uh, provide DH by DHCP networking to the nodes to then allow the installation of the image in them, right? But when you provide DHCP and you have different leaves, each of them with its top of the rack switch, the DHCP request, when this guy wants to boot up, uh, needs to go through a top of the rack switch, right? So, well, uh, thanks to a technology called uh, DHCP relay, which is even in the most basic um, top of the rack switches, we can do that. We can forward, we can relay that DHCP request and then it will go to the spine switch and all the way to Ironic, right? This, which might be simple to understand, it's not easy to implement, but we did it and it's there in Ironic now. Um, another one, this, this is perhaps not easier to implement, but it's, it's more dependent on the driver that you use, for example, Redfish, and uh, well, it will allow you to set some uh, BIOS settings, right? So this is uh, uh, another feature that you have in, in Ironic. Another very cool one, it's uh, the Nodes Auto Discovery. In this case, when you add new nodes to, the, to your network, to your data center, you rack them up, power them on, make sure that the NIC is uh, connected to the right ports, etc., and they will be auto-discovered, registered to Ironic. And if you want, and there's an example in here, you can do things like, hey, if you detect that this node is a Dell node, uh, configure this password, right? You can do things like that. You can do a number of things. There are a number of um, parameters. This is just one of the examples of uh, uh, data collected during inspection, right? But you can play with this if you want. And if you don't do anything, uh, at least you have the notes discovered for yourself. So it's pretty nice. And then Redfish. Redfish is, um, if, if you've seen, I'm sure you know IPMI. So Redfish is a similar idea with many more features and also API driven, 100% API driven. Many vendors have implemented, uh, all the famous ones, uh, Redfish in their VMCs. So you can now power on, power off remotely, right? Uh, make some changes, change boot order, set some uh, bias parameters through Redfish. And Aeronic supports that, okay? So this is an introduction to many of the things that you can do with uh, Ironic, so that then, if you want, you can also use it to deploy uh, OpenShift in it. And well, this will be pretty simple. Um, put a link in there, uh, I'm gonna explain in a second. But uh, essentially, you have your OpenStack with Ironic in it, and you use it as you usually will use it, right, to deploy bare metal nodes. In this case, you're gonna deploy bare metal nodes that then are gonna be used uh, to build an OpenShift cluster, right, a Kubernetes cluster. So what you do is you deploy them, pre-deploy them, and once the operating system is in them with the network and everything else that's needed to have them online, you point the OpenShift installer to them and you have everything installed. Do you remember about the two types of experience that I mentioned before for installing um, OpenShift? Uh, user provisioned and installer provisioned. In this case, it's user provision because you, as a user, provision the, in this case, the operating system, and once everything is up and running with nothing in it, is when then the installer will install uh, what's remaining to create the cluster, which is all the OpenShift uh, itself and its dependencies, okay? So in, in this link, um, you will see how we explain uh, to do this installation on bare metal. It doesn't talk about Ironic in particular. It says, have the nodes installed. Maybe you can install a DHCP server uh, and, a, and a Pixie server, right? Or you know, you can install different ways, uh, in different ways, these bare metal nodes. So 
one of them, and a very cool one, is with Ironic. Okay, for many of the reasons that I explained before. Okay, and to finish, uh, how much time do I have? Some time, okay. Um, a new project, a new project that has uh, connections with both OpenStack and Kubernetes. So this project is Metal Cubed. Uh, Metal Cubed is focused, if you remember, about the four footprints that I was talking about before. We've been talking about the private cloud with OpenStack, but uh, the private cloud with virtual uh, machines, a little bit of uh, bare metal as well, but this is uh, focused on bare metal. Okay, so Metal Cubed. So Metal Cubed uses Ironic, and it also uses the Kubernetes Operators Framework. Uh, are you familiar with the Kubernetes Operators Framework? Okay, so it's a way of automating knowledge that you would have to do uh, manually otherwise. Like create a bare metal node, destroy a bare metal node. Um, tasks that, as I said before, uh, you would do as a human or via the API, an operator can automate all these tasks for you. So thanks to this interface uh, and to Ironic, um, we have Metal Cubed being able uh, to manage, to do host, bare metal host management with Kubernetes. What does that mean? Well, it means that one, Metal Cubed runs on Kubernetes, right? It's, it's, uh, you need Kubernetes cluster to, to be able to use it and is managed through Kubernetes interfaces, yeah? So Kubernetes interface as well, uh, the cluster API. So what happens here? Well, um, you can have, uh, you can get or manage machines through the cluster API as if they were uh, machines in, you know, uh, AWS, right, or OpenStack. Okay, so you do this, and in particular, the operator uh, will get these requests. Say that one request is, uh, give me one machine, right? And that machine could be an AWS machine, it could be an OpenStack machine, or it can be a physical machine in here, right? This comes through the cluster API, okay? So now the operator says, okay, so I'm here to provide bare metal node, this request is asking me to do this uh, deployment and I know how to manage uh, bare metal nodes because I know Ironic. And I know that uh, when I want a node, I will tell Ironic, hey, um, install this image in this node, change the boot order, tell me when uh, you're done, and I will pass all this information back to Kubernetes to say, here you go, I have a node for you. I'm oversimplifying, but you know, uh, that's what we care about. This experience uh, of having a, uh, a cloud-like experience with bare metal. That's not easy. That's and, and, and for those of us who have been in the Ironic project for uh, a number of years, you can see that thanks to Ironic, we've simplified a lot of this uh, process, right? But the process of automating all the interaction with uh, bare metal, uh, all this knowledge is, is, has been captured by Ironic and now is used by this operator and exposed to Kubernetes, yeah? Okay, so if you want to give it a go, uh, go to metal3.io, metal3 pronounced uh, metal cubed, and if you want, uh, and this is in general, and if you want to install Kubernetes in it, uh, OpenShift, you can go to our um, GitHub, um, well, th this is the GitHub of the OpenShift installer, right? And in the documents, one of them is how to install, um, and by the way, this is under the category of installer provision infrastructure. So this document will tell you, we're working on, on adding more details to that document, but if you wanna try it out now, uh, it's, it's there for you to use. Uh, as, as I said before, also if you try this out, feel free to open issues, to ask us questions. Uh, we're more than happy to uh, learn from your feedback. And, and if you wanna fix code, um, 
you know that's always welcome okay all right so in summary this is a bit of everything we talked about today install kubernetes on openstack you have these urls in there courier performance courier is an important integration point provides a lot of uh, performance improvements you need them uh, a reference architecture for you to learn about how all of this looks like and how to adapt it to your own um, uh, use case and to your own uh, platforms. Um, ironic bare metal. Here you can see, well, the whole, say, features. Th this is more uh, the general documentation uh, about uh, Ironic with many details, including what I said about the ML2 uh, and civil networking driver, et cetera, right? Everything is captured in here. And then the metal uh, cubed, uh, metalfree.io URL for you to learn more about it. And with that, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. Uh, so do we have another microphone? Yeah. Um, your presentation said um, Kubernetes on OpenStack. So thinking about the upside down case, like um, o OSP managed by OpenShift, uh, is that possible? So um, is that possible? OSP, OpenStack, uh, as uh, she by Red Hat, uh, has its services in containers already. Uh, not on an OpenShift cluster, right? Even though if it's, it would be technically possible, it's mm -hmm. not something that has enough value to the end users as to put all that work to have OpenStack on an OpenShift cluster. Everything is containerized though, right? But not as in an OpenShift uh, cluster. Thank you. Sure. Okay, do I have more time? No more questions? Uh, there's another question there. Uh, I think you mentioned about the uh, performance improvement using Kuli, uh, about, uh, I mean, the communication between different nodes. I guess that this I that is related to the something like VXLAN offload of Nick. I guess that we can use a Nick offloading feature for VXLAN if we do not have the duplicated VXLAN. So I think this is related to that feature. Is it, is it uh, the same? Uh, is it correct? Um, it's, it's, it? it's two separate performance improvements. Uh -huh. uh, one is the offload that uh, you get from the NIC, uh -huh. and another one is the uh, lack of fragmentation when you put a tunnel inside tunnel or tunnel, because you could still have the VXLAN offload, but only on one VXLAN layer, not in the two of them. Can I just follow on the same one? So the benchmark which you've shown, so nine times faster, was it in the scenario where you have courier and VXLAN offload of the NIC, or is it improvement coming only from the service you created? No, both, but but this is always, uh, VXLAN offload is always there. Yes, 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 that's, that's mm -hmm. why the question. So, yeah. it's, so it's a benefit combined because you use both of these features. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. All right, well, uh, thanks everyone for attending this session and I hope you find it, uh, you found it useful.